is, is that I've given at a few conferences um, over time. Um, in a way, I have to apologize to you all. This is a talk that about once or twice a year I like to throw away and, and do over again just because otherwise I get really tired of it, much less the people who have to listen to me drone on and on um, for an hour each time. But I didn't quite get around to doing that. So this is probably the last performance of this particular version of it. If you've seen it in the last couple months or so, um, you're, you're not going to learn a whole lot that you didn't learn then. So I apologize to you for that. But um, so it goes. One of, one of the nice things about giving to a smaller group like this is that it's really easy to take questions and all that. So if I skip over anything that you're interested in or if you have a question, just throw something at me and, um, and we can go on from there. And we'll see how far off I can put you off the schedule by the time we're done. So, theme for the talk it comes from a quote from Linus last June saying that, yeah, you know, maybe you're waiting for power and free sex and all that, but don't expect the kernel to wait for you. The kernel's moving on. Right, the kernel's always heading forward into new and exciting stuff. This is a guy who knows what he's talking about. So, um, so um, obviously, this, this is where we're going. So, where we're going, we'll start actually by looking backwards. This is the, the set of kernel releases that came out over the course of the last year, starting with 2633 back in February. You see, we've done five of them. We've settled into a cadence that is almost exactly 80 days per release. It's coming down almost to the point where you can set your watch by it, actually. Uh, exactly. We've done five releases. Every one of these releases has at least 1,100 developers involved with it. A lot of people working with the kernel and so on. And over the course of a year, we had almost 3,000 people who have contributed to the kernel. Uh-oh. Um, it's definitely on. Does that work better? Well, if it's coming out of that one, I'll stand over here and we'll have stereo. <laughs> anyway, um, so I can, what I can say is that the process seems to be working pretty well. In fact, when this group of very dark people um, came together back in November at the Kernel Summit in Boston, pretty much agreed that the process is working and there's not a whole lot that we really need to change in terms of serious details about how the kernel development process is going. It's just scaled up to what we're doing. Um, questions about how much bigger it could scale, but questions about whether it actually makes sense to scale it a whole lot bigger than it is now, because the kernel is a pretty big project with an awful lot of people in there. If we look at these numbers, see it again, you can see um, is that we're merging somewhere on the order of 10,000 changes for every release. It's dropped down a little bit from, from its highs of about 2631, 32, although 37 was a uh, very active kernel development cycle. 38, when it comes out, I predict will come out at right about 10,000 changes, uh, based on what I've seen before, just a little bit um, below that, right, right in line with these other processes here. So we've seen 51,000 changes merged over the course of about 400 days, which is the development time associated with one year's worth of releases, like that. That comes down to 124 changes going in every day. And we've managed to add about 3,500 lines of code to the kernel every day of the year, 365 days of the year, no breaks, nothing like that. And that we did even though 2636 was actually smaller than its predecessor by about 50,000 lines. It's the first time we've ever done that, I think, as far as I can tell. I could not find a kernel release that was smaller than its predecessor any other time. And I don't think we'll see it again anytime soon, but we did it once. So where does this word come from? It's the usual set of statistics I run looking at the, the the changes that went into, again, the same about 400 days worth of development, five kernel releases, and associating um, changes with the employers that sponsored the work and so on. And you get a, a table that really hasn't changed a whole lot over the course of the last two years. You see, as always, right up at the top, we have people working on their own time, supplying something just under 20% of the code that we know about going into the kernel. Just about everything else, minus a, a small contingent of unknown people that we can't pin down. Um, so about everything else is coming from people who are paid to do this work. The kernel is very much the product of, of paid engineers at this point. We always have Red Hat and Intel, Novell and IBM kind of up there at the top, with Red Hat being at the top of all of them, and then various other companies that kind of move around depending on what's going on at various levels in there. So, you know, we're seeing some companies that people really thought were quite hostile to kernel development that managed to at least shovel stuff in that some people actually call code. Um, it, it does kind of work. It's, it's a good step in the right direction. It's better than what they did before. And so on. And we have, on the order, the better part of 400 other companies 
that, that just didn't quite fit on my slide that are also contributing to the kernel over a period of time like this. We have a lot of companies putting code into the kernel, and it just keeps on going that way, and it seems to be um, increasing over time. Although it's hard to tell because our, the quality of our information is also increasing over time. Academics is really anybody working within the context of a research institution. So professors, um, it can be grad students doing, um, doing you know, funded research, that sort of thing. It's typically been a very small portion of things. It's actually grown a little bit over time, which is good. Um, I've been a little discouraged in the sense that we have such a tiny bit of stuff actually coming out of, of universities. I've been trying to figure out ways to improve that, and that's hard. From the academic environment now, or yeah. Um, yeah, not a whole lot. I think there's a few, but not a whole lot um, at this point. You know, that that crowd has long been pushed out of, of IT services at the universities. You know, instead we have things locked up in boxes, and you have to call in the guy with the keys to do it. You don't really get the the graybeards working at the universities doing that sort of stuff the way they used to once upon a time. And it's professional. Now. All right, um, so all this I've been talking about so far is, is mainline. I just tossed together a couple of slides regarding how the stable kernel process works because most of us, well, maybe not in this room, but in, most of us don't actually run mainline kernels. We run something that is usually derived from a stable release and then further um, messed with by the distributors and so on. But there is a whole set of stable releases come out managed by Greg Crow Hartman, um, pulling together important fixes to, to kernels. And Uh, whatever kernel is in a sense as stable as we can make it but nobody would say that there are no bugs remaining in it there are always things that will be found that will be fixed and as we'll see they can be fixed over the course of many years um, this is the history of, of relatively recent stable kernel or of kernel releases and the stable updates that went with it so we see back in 2625 they had 20 updates supplied to it with about 500 patches um, down to 2636 which is the current um, as far as stable updates go, there have been no 37 updates yet. We had um, three of them with 500 changes. Notice the same number of changes here as we had in 20 updates back in those days. The, the number of changes going into the stable updates has increased tremendously over the course of the years. This is, um, I don't think that is a function of our kernel releases being that much buggier than they used to. I think it's a more a matter of, of better discipline, of identifying fixes that should be applied to stable to previously released kernels and putting them into the stable um, update stream. So that's what we're seeing there. So the ones that are currently maintained by Greg are 32 and 36. 32 has been picked by a number of distributors, um, generally sort of in the enterprise level, as being the, the kernel they're going to maintain for a long time. So Greg is working with them and helping to maintain these kernels, getting patches from a lot of distributors and uh, pulling together. That's why 32 has had such a large number of, of fixes applied to it and a large number of updates. Um, 27 was maintained that way for a fair while as well. Yes? Well, it's actually, it's getting a little bit more complicated than that anymore. Um, you know, in terms of for the enterprise distributors, I don't think they're ready to engage with that question yet. They're still dealing with, with the one they're really just getting serious about shipping now in a lot of cases. Um, but we do have, we're starting to see a lot of people make, picking up other kernels as long-term kernels and maintaining them. This is not something that we had before. So Willie Tavreau, who maintained 2.4, I think he still technically maintains 2.4, um, for, for many years, has picked up 2.627, and he plans to keep that going for a long, long time. So if you want a kernel that you can run forever, um, that would be one that you could pick. Um, 2.635 instead was picked by a whole group of embedded Linux companies back towards I was going to say towards the fall, this is the Northern Hemisphere fall. <laughs> um, a number of these companies came together and they said, okay, we're all going to pick one kernel that we're going to ship in our products, and we're going to try to actually get our changes upstream and so on, and try to improve the whole process of, of how things work between the embedded community and, and the kernel development community. So I think it's a good sign. Andy Clean has picked up that kernel, and he will be maintaining it for a fair while 
as the embedded flight kernel. Meanwhile, um, Wind River was shipping 34, so Paul Gormaker has picked that up and he'll be maintaining that for a while as well. So we actually have a number of long-term kernels that are being maintained uh, into the future. I don't think we'll add to that number for a little while, but, but we're seeing a, an evolution of the process as more of these kernels get, get longer lifetimes. So, looking back at this chart one more time, this is the last time I'll flick this on you, just looking at the number of changes that um, 31 and 32 have scrolled off at the top there. They had about 12,000 changes each applied to them. So um, there was for a while what really looked like a downward trend in the, the number of changes going into the kernel. Uh, 37 kind of bumped that up a bit, partly due to a lot of stuff that went into the staging tree and other one stuff. Um, 38 is going to be right along that trend, like I said before. So some people might look at this and say, okay, hey, we're slowing down. Um, are we there? Back in 2005, Andrew Morton said that the patch volume had to drop because we were actually going to have to finish this kernel someday. Um, that was when we were merging about 4,000 changes per kernel that he said that. Um, and I, I've not been able to resist giving him grief ever since. But um, one could say that it um, looks like things are dropping. Is it getting boring now? We actually solved all the real problems that we had to solve. Um, is it time to sort of kick back and all that? And I think the answer to that really is no. Um, certain things have stopped. I mean, anything that we had to do to catch up with any other system out there is for the most part done, with always exceptions, and so on. A long process of feeding in code to the staging tree, trying to get a lot of out-of-tree code into the mainline kernel, has more or less completed. So there was a period where we were just shoveling a whole lot of code into the tree, and we're not really doing that anymore. So um, while we may not see the same sort of patch volumes that we saw around 2631, 32, there was a lot going on, and I don't really expect to see a downward trend. I don't expect to see the kernel development process slow down. So I'll spend the rest of the time talking about where I do think things are going. Um, again, if there are questions you can ask. A fairly easy one to predict at this point is 2638, which is due probably sometime around the end of March, if we stick to the usual cadence there. Um, we're currently at 2638 RC2. Um, what's coming is a whole lot of sort of very intense internal performance-oriented work that got put in this time. So the, the VFS scalability work, changing the way the dentry cache works, the way the, um, the caching of the lookup of file names, essentially, in the file system works, went in finally for 2638. This is a, a very tricky set of changes to the core virtual file system layer that seems to be fairly solid, but um, had some people worried for a while. Another interesting change is transparent huge pages. Your typical processor deals with memory in, in units of pages, which are 4,000, about 4 kilobytes on most architectures that we support. But the processors actually support many page sizes, um, larger ones starting at 2 megabytes and going up even into the gigabyte range from page sizes if you want to. There can be advantages to actually using uh, larger page sizes like that, mostly in the performance area. If you're using larger pages, then page faults are, will happen less often. They're cheaper to satisfy when they do happen and you have a lot less pressure on your translation look-aside buffer, which can also um, cause you to have to do lookups more often. So um, putting in, if you can use these huge pages more often, you can actually run faster, is what it comes down to. So we've been able to work with huge pages for years in Linux. It's just a very sort of administrator-heavy, um, application developer-heavy, fiddly sort of process to do it. Transparent huge pages make it just happen. If you've got an application running and there's a huge page available and it looks like it will work there, the, the kernel will actually coalesce a whole bunch of small pages into a huge page and substitute that in. And then it will split it apart again if it has to, and it makes it all just sort of happen automatically. You don't get quite the performance benefit that you get from using huge TLBFS and actually really messing with it at a low level. But um, seeing as it just works for everything, it, it helps a lot and I think will really increase the use of, of huge pages in production systems. Um, this is a feature that Red Hat actually shipped with Enterprise Linux 6, but we'll get it in the mainline as of 38. Um, per session group scheduling, this is the, the famous 200 line kernel patch that people talked about for a while. That um, just <coughs> changes the way the kernel divides tasks up and splits up the, the available processor time, trying to keep processes from interfering with each other in terms of how they contend for the scheduler for the CPU. So it's, in a sense it's not a significant feature because group scheduling is something we've supported since about 26 or so. But um, this, again, makes it just work, makes it just happen. And so um, it went in. It's more like a 700-line patch in the version that I actually saw 
Um, not counting the fixes that, that followed it. So it has grown. This there. And then some other sort of stuff. Transmit packet steering is just a high-end networking performance sort of thing, trying to direct packets out through the right processor and so on. And trusted encrypted keys is a feature using the TPM and um, integrity verification and all that so that people can lock down your system and you can't actually get to it, which is something we've all been um, clamoring for. <laughs> but there are actually useful um, uses for that sort of technology as well. It's the usual two-edged sword. So that's what's coming with 2638, along with a 1,000 drivers and um, a lot of fixes and all the usual sorts of things. Uh, I listed a whole lot more on LW1 if you want to look there. But that's what we got coming there. Um, well, do from here is look at specific subject areas and kind of look at where we come from and where we're going. Starting with file systems. Um, we can go back as far as 31, where we see ButterFS, ButterFS file system stabilizing. Various changes going in. We merged a couple of new file systems in 34. LogFS, which is for um, solid state storage, small embedded system sorts of things. Ceph instead being a large scale distributed um, high availability file system sort of thing. Um, very different sort of stuff. Um, continuing to improve ButterFS. A uh, bunch of scalability work for EXT4 went in for 37. A bunch of that had to be um, turned off at the last minute because it didn't work quite right. So we'll get the rest of that for, for 38 going in there. Sort of where we come from file systems. So where we stand now is well, we have a lot of file systems. There's really two that most people are paying the most attention to out there, um, certainly in the desktop areas and so on. There's EXT4, which is the, the continuing evolution of the EXT file system series that we've had in Linux pretty much forever. EXT4 raises a lot of limits, performs better, does all the sorts of things that we want, and is really pretty much ready for production use. People are using it at this point, and it's working pretty well. But EXT4 is also really seen as being the end of the line in a way because it's, it's a very old file system architecture. And we've, we've moved on, we want to do other things. And that's why the ButterFS project was started. ButterFS is a whole brand new, written from scratch file system which adds a lot of very interesting features, snapshotting, um, built-in um, built RAID management, a whole lot of stuff is going into ButterFS that will make it, I think, a very nice file system to have once it's um, set to go. It's getting closer. The, the ButterFS developers will not tell you to put your production data on it right now because um, they really don't like what happens when um, they lose people's data. So um, so they're not saying it's ready yet, but um, be that as it may, the, the Migo people have actually decided to, to settle on it and to use it as their default file system. So someday this year, maybe if you can actually get a Migo device, it um, should have ButterFS on it, at least for um, some of the of the user experiences. I don't think they're all going to ButterFS at this point. But um, it has a lot of the features that they want, and they didn't want to go through another transition a couple of years from now. So they're just going with it. And they've actually said they've had less trouble from ButterFS than they've had from the XT4, for whatever that's worth. So that's where that stands. So what's coming with ButterFS, we'll see the stabilization and completion of that. Maybe by the end of this year, they'll start making noises about it getting closer to being ready for production work. I don't know. Um, like I said, file system developers are conservative that way. Um, completing things like the RAID support, when are we going to get the, the full RAID stuff in there? <laughs> All right, I'll ask Chris. <laughs> anyway, um, getting close to that. Data migration, there's, there's some interesting patches um, for managing ButterFS on a, top of a hybrid sort of storage device. We've got some very fast solid state storage, slower rotating storage. And you try to figure out which data is, is in most active use and you keep that in the fast storage. That kind of data migration, moving things between different types of storage devices. Um, and actually using the features that ButterFS provides. For example, Fedora is working on a, a feature to allow the administrator to snapshot the state of a system before applying an update. Then apply the update, and if the update didn't go right, you just go back to the snapshot and life goes on as usual. Um, Fedora, as you may know, actually issues a few updates here and there, so it might be a nice thing to, to have to sort of um, keep up with that. The XT4 is um, just sort of going into production use. May get, gain a few features. There's a snapshotting patch out there for the XT4, but I don't know if that's going to go in or not. I haven't really seen. And continued performance work, scalability work, and so on. And the, and the VFS scalability work that I mentioned before is going on. Yeah. Well, 
well, bright barriers as such don't actually exist in the storage layer anymore. That, that got changed um, over the course of the last few months. Um, so things have improved there. In terms of features, I don't know. There's, there's, there's a certain tension there. But, you know, LVM is getting better. Some file systems like ButterFS are, are picking up features that LVM would otherwise provide. You know, if you're using ButterFS, I'm not sure what you would use LVM for to go with it at this point. Um, because, you know, it'll, you know, LVM can give you snapshot, can give you multiple device support, give you all that sort of stuff that ButterFS will all do for you, also do for you. And there are some real advantages to having the file system understand the topology of the of the storage structure at that level. So, you know, they'll continue to get better and all that. But um, where it will end up, I don't know. It depends on what you're doing, I think. All right, moving down a layer to the storage layer. Uh, um, in 31, we saw the addition of the storage topology infrastructure, which lets us just have a better understanding of how our storage devices are put together so the kernel and user space both can make better use of what's there. Um, various scalability improvements have gone in over time. We got the, um, the I.O. bandwidth controller put in so that you can actually control the I.O. bandwidth used by groups of processes if you want to. And there's a way to do that at a couple of levels, so I'll come back to. Um, hard barriers came out in, in 37, like I mentioned before. Um, so we sort of changed the way we deal with synchronization in the storage layer to, to simplify a lot of things. And um, in 38, we saw the, the merging of, of a new target mode implementation for the SCSI layer. And the end of a, well, I won't say it's the end of a long flame war, but shall we say the next step in, in the long flame war having to do with, um, with what's the best way to support target mode and SCSI. Target mode being where your computer actually behaves like a SCSI device, like a target, and can um, export the device, usually over some sort of network-based protocol out there, so you can build big storage arrays, that sort of thing. So that went in for 38 and should improve things quite a bit in that area if you're building large infiniband storage devices, which I'm sure most of us are. So, storage, various things that are happening in the um, in the storage area. The, at the top of my list, I think, really, is the, the handling of solid-state storage devices. Because we've gone from a situation where, with a rotating disk, you can get you know, 100 or so I.O. operations per second, maybe 200 if you've got a really nice disk and a tailwind. Um, Otherwise, that's about all you get. Solid state storage devices are, are pushing up in the area of 100,000, a million I.O. operations per second. So we've, we've jumped a few orders of magnitude just like that. And that's going to expose all kinds of, of scalability bottlenecks that you never knew you had until you actually tried to do it. So there's a whole long job of streamlining the storage layer to, to squeeze all of this extra overhead out. And there's, there are patches out there that do pieces of it. But it's going to be a long problem because, as, as Jens Axpo put it, there isn't one thing you fix and you've gotten rid of the scalability problems in the block layer. You go through and you do this fix and you've gained a half a percent. You do that fix and that gives you one percent and so on. And after a while, you're actually talking um, significant improvements. But it takes a while and a lot of work to really squeeze all that stuff out. Um, various other things, RAID unification. How is that going, Neil? <laughs> um, it's getting there. Very good. Um, and hierarchical storage, like I mentioned before, hybrid devices, that sort of thing, dealing with that sort of stuff. All happening at the storage layer. Um, a lot of work going on because the storage layer is, is a key part of the performance of our system. So um, we'll see a lot of work being done there as well. Yes? Sorry, I didn't quite catch it. Which support? Trim support. How is trim support looking? Trim support or discard support is, is a mechanism for telling a storage device that a particular range of blocks does not actually contain useful data on the device. This is very useful for solid stage storage devices that are always having to move data around and do garbage collection and all that stuff to do wear leveling. It's useful for other kinds of devices as well. Um, the, the kernel supports the feature very well at this point. Um, we have it, we can do it in what's called online where it happens as the system's going or offline. The problem is that the hardware tends not to support it very well at all. And so we found that a feature that's really supposed to improve performance tends to make it worse in a lot of cases. So figuring out how to actually really use this feature on, on real-world devices is, is proving hard. But um, the kernel supports it pretty nicely at this point. All right, moving on. Memory management. For a while, memory management got kind of slow, and I wasn't talking about it, but there's a lot happening with memory management as well. 
So if we look over the course of the last year or so, we got a memory leak checker put into the kernel. Very interesting stuff if you look at it. The memory leak checker actually does a sort of a mark and sweep sort of process. It looks like something you would find in a Lisp interpreter. But it's, um, as a debugging technology, it's very useful. It's, it's not something you turn on in a production system. Oh. HW poison is a high reliability mechanism to try to keep the kernel system running at the highest possible level in the in the face of of hard memory errors and trying to respond to that better using hardware support that sort of thing. In 32 as well we saw the addition of, of KSM. It's an interesting little module will go will scan through your memory, try to find pages that have duplicated contents. They have, they have the same thing. When it finds such a thing, it will throw one of the copies away and have the two processes share the same copy of it in a, in a copy on write mode so that they can split apart again if they have to. Um, this is very useful when dealing with virtualized workloads where you tend to have a lot of this sort of thing. Um, so this came out of the KVM project and is very is of interest to that. This is especially interesting if you're running virtualized Windows clients, which I'm told keep a whole lot of pages containing zeros around. Because you can never have too many of those, evidently. Um, <laughs> But, but um, they, they tend to compress very nicely, so you can get a lot of your memory back um, that way. Memory compaction is, is a sort of online defragmentation technique for, for main memory. Um, memory over time gets to get, tends to get fragmented, so it can be hard to find groups of con physically contiguous pages in memory. The memory compaction code just uses the page migration mechanism built into the kernel to move pages around when it can, to try to free up large areas so that you can um, get larger chunks. It's been a nice feature to have for a while. With the addition of the transparent huge page support, it's become very important because transparent huge pages won't work if you can't get huge pages. So you've got to be able to, to shove things aside and clear these large pages. So it's really only with 38 that we're seeing memory compaction come into, into serious use in, um, in mainline kernels, and they're, they're still working some things out of it. Um, right back is an issue I'll come back to in a moment, and like I said, transparent huge pages in 38. Um, what's coming? Right back is just the process of, of taking dirty data that you have in main memory and writing it back to disk, back to persistent storage, so you have it there. It's become clear over the last year or two that we have some real performance problems in that area. But a lot of things that people see as interactivity problems and so on are really write back problems. So there's a lot of work being done trying to figure out where it is that we went wrong with write back because Depending on who you ask, somewhere around 2618 or so, we had some sort of a golden area where right back worked. And, um, but different people have different golden areas, mind you. Um, but anyway, we're going to try to fix the right back problem. That's one of our bigger performance problems now. And we're seeing a lot of work around technologies like KSM that I mentioned on the last slide of trying to make better use of our main memory, either by, by filtering out duplicates and having them share are actually compressing memory into memory. So you share, you store compressed copies of pages and then you uncompress them when they're actually referenced again. Um, this can be useful for certain sorts of things. Or trying to stash copies of things in um, something like a solid state device, if you have a large solid state device where you can use that as sort of a, a faster, closer swap device. There's a lot of things happening in this area with names like transcendent memory and so on, um, trying to, to improve our use of memory in that way. How much of that stuff will get in the main line, I'm not sure. There's a certain amount of resistance to merging some of this stuff. But, but there's a lot of interest in it, and it keeps coming, so I think we'll see more of it. So, moving on to a different area. Um, real time. Real time being our attempt to support deterministic response times in, in the Linux kernel. Something that has been said to really to not be possible for a long time. But it is getting possible, especially if you have the right hardware that doesn't kind of mess with you behind your back. Anyway, um, a lot of stuff that's in the mainline kernel has actually come by way of the real-time tree, a surprising amount of it, actually. So um, some of the stuff we've seen more recently has included um, perf events, and, um, which I'll come back to later, changing some of the, the low-level spin lock stuff in preparation for a bigger merge, which may happen sometime soon. And really, as of 37 or 38, um, you can really run a kernel without the big kernel lock at all, which is a, um, a very nice thing. That's been a 15-year process to to get rid of that lock, um, but we've finally gotten there. But meanwhile, there's still this large um, added tree patch set that's shipped by all these distributors um, at the embedded level, at the enterprise level, and so on. It's been out there for a long time. It's been an era where we've worked really hard on getting out of tree code into the main line. So it's all there and we can all work on it. There's still this really big patch set that is maintained by some of the people who are most adamant about getting code into the main line. 
So um, it's been kind of funny, but it's there. They, they say they're going to merge it. Um, so we'll see some of this stuff. There's some memory management stuff, preemptability the memory management layer code that didn't make it this time around. Maybe for 39, it'll get into the, um, the kernel. Thomas Gleickster told me he was going to merge the sleeping spin lock code for 38. Um, at this point, I just don't think he's going to do that. But, um, but sometime this year, maybe he'll actually get around to that. So if you see Thomas, give him a brief. Then stand back. Thomas is big. <laughs> that sort of thing. But the sleeping spin lock code is the, the, the low-level magic that makes the whole real-time patch work. Because it's what allows the kernel to be preempted at any time. So any time you've got something more important coming along, you can set aside whatever you're doing and respond to it. So that's, that's really the piece that has to be merged before you can say the real-time patch set has gone in. And um, it's been many years because it's some pretty scary code for some of them. Um, various scalability issues. The way the real-time tree works um, tends to lead to contention much more quickly. So you find, you find scalability problems there first um, before even the really big iron systems find them. So a lot of the stuff like the, the VFS work that I mentioned before was actually tested through the real-time tree first because they could actually reproduce the problems that it was aiming to solve. So you see a lot of that happening there. It's kind of become the, the scalability workshop, which is really sort of interesting. That's not something they set out to do at all. And there's various sorts of open problems, a lot of which having to do with the fact that if you're working in a throughput-oriented environment, one of the things you really want to do is to decrease communications between CPUs as much as you can. So there's a big push towards per-CPU data, so isolating data um, and having the CPU stay away from each other. Per-CPU data doesn't work well with the real-time preemption stuff because as soon as you're dealing with per-CPU data, you can't be preempted, you can't be migrated, because otherwise the the invariants that you're counting on to make the per CPU access is safe don't apply anymore. So um, some of the things they've done for things like per CPU variables are pretty scary if you look in the real time tree now. Um, and they don't really understand, I don't think, how they're going to solve that still. Because that's, that's a fundamental conflict between, as Paul McKinney put it, real time on one side and real fast on the other. And um, sometimes it's hard to have both. So, one other thing to mention with regard to real-time is, is deadline scheduling. It's an interesting development that's out there. If you look at the way real-time is specified, you know, POSIX real-time and all that, it's all based around priorities. You put somebody in a real-time scheduling class and give them a priority, and whichever process has the prior, highest priority is the one that actually runs at any given time. The thing is, this doesn't really map all that well to, to real-world tasks, and it's something that the research community has moved beyond a long time ago. They've instead moved into an area that they call deadline scheduling, which changes this by doing away with the priorities altogether. Instead of a priority, you give a process um, what's called a worst case execution time, the amount of CPU time it's going to need to get a job done, and a deadline. So essentially it says, I need this much CPU time by that time there. And then perhaps a periodicity, if it's this happening regularly, which it often is, then I need this um, deadline reinstated every so often, and, you know, every however many milliseconds, that sort of thing. So if you do this, if you define your scheduling in this way, you can actually write a scheduler that will, one, guarantee that every process in the system will meet its deadlines, and two, um, refuse admission to any process that would cause those guarantees to be um, violated. So it allows you to really provide good isolation between real-time tasks on the same system and make sure they can meet their deadlines. There's a deadline scheduling patch out there. This is actually going to go into the academic column when it goes into the kernel because it comes out of the um, School of Santana Superiore in, in Pisa, Italy. Um, it works, but there's a lot of sort of interesting problems that you run into as soon as you take deadline scheduling and try to apply it to the real world, especially if you've got um, large numbers of cores in your system. There, there, there's some problems to solve yet. So I'm not sure when that will go in, but it's getting closer. It's being worked on. So um, we'll see this at some point. And then we should be really the first general purpose operating system to have this feature and it, that's actually exposed as such. I mean, Mac OS actually has deadline scheduling in it in a, in a more limited sort of way, but we'll have it as a general purpose feature. And it'll be a good thing. Drivers, I'm not really going to say a whole lot about um, drivers. Kind of mentioned a few interesting ones that have gone in. Um, improvements, I kind of modernizing the Radeon driver. We finally got the new Vo driver in. A little while back, um, Dave had a good time with that, as I recall. <laughs> um, there's things like that. And with 2637, Broadcom finally actually came around and gave us a wireless driver. That sort of thing. So, in the areas that have been kind of the worst problems for Linux, 
to have been graphics and wireless networking. One could say that things are almost solved, but you know that almost, unfortunately, is um, is kind of a big almost. But we're getting there. Um, just as a sort of an exercise in fun, I just went through and counted all the configuration options you find under the driver tree. Um, configuration options are a pretty poor analog to drivers. They don't they don't map exactly, but there's there will be some proportionality there. So you can look and you can see that we're adding about 170 things you can choose in the driver tree in every kernel release. So um, we're adding a lot of stuff. There's a lot of drivers going in. Um, we really have the best hardware support of just about anybody out there. And an awful lot of hardware um, has support by the time it's, it's available to users. It's really working pretty well for the most part. Um, so why would I say there's a problem? The problem, of course, is that we still have certain vendors that don't want to work with us. Um, we're finding this problem, especially, of course, in the embedded area, which is kind of behind other areas in a lot of ways. So embedded graphics chipsets are really a problem. Um, things like that. We, um, we have some companies that just haven't quite um, gotten the message yet about how it is that you work with the, um, with the kernel development community. So it's a matter of talking to these vendors and trying to beat some sense into them. It's something we've been doing for years. Um, and you know, over time, you see the lights come on and companies figured out that really working with us makes their lives easier than working against us. And so um, we'll get there, but I hate to say when. This is really sort of a facet of what I call, at this point, um, the larger embedded problem. Where we have, this is now a problem we see across the kernel. We've got people working under incredible deadlines, incredible secrecy, and um, very short, short product cycles. It makes it very hard for embedded kernel developers to work with the community with what they're doing because they're, they're under the gun and they can't talk. And then by the time that they can talk about what they're doing, they're under the gun for the next project. So um, what we end up with is a lot of um, code that never makes it into the mainline tree. There's a lot of code out there that's had no community input. And if you look at this code, you um, really wish you weren't running it on any device you actually cared about. Um, and things just don't get fixed. And it's, it's an ongoing problem. It's, again, one of these things that we just have to talk to people and try to fix. The, um, the decision in the embedded community to name a flag kernel to, that they would try to get their stuff into is a really um, encouraging development in that regard. Uh, we haven't seen a whole lot of code actually coming from that direction yet, but one can hope that um, over time, because I think that they see a problem there too, even if they don't really see their way through to the solution yet. Okay, um, related problem with drivers and all that is power management. I don't have a whole lot to say about that. We've added various features over time, trying to improve our power behavior um, over time. And since we have a talk about this later, I don't think I really want to talk about it too much. But um, let's just say that we're getting better over time. We've got a ways to go yet, um, both you know, at the embedded level, but also at the large scale data center level where power usage is really just as important and just as relevant and all that. So what's coming in this area includes lots of fixes because every bit of hardware, of course, needs to be fixed to do this sort of stuff right. We've seen some um, relatively new things. A lot of this is trying to find a way to solve the Android problem that isn't the Android way of solving the problem. A way that's, that's actually mergeable, but which would be easy for them to, um, to make use of, should they get around to it. The, the Android developer who works with this stuff, Arve, um, recently said that he hasn't actually even looked at this code yet. So we don't know if it's going to um, be something that they can move to or not. Cause you know, they're kind of working in the embedded environment and they have a lot of those same problems. They haven't had time to deal with it. But maybe someday we'll, we'll settle that stuff out. And various other things like um, idle cycle injection way of running a system right at the, the edge of where it melts. And as soon as the, the silicon gets a little soft, you force some idle cycles in there so it, um, it keeps going, that sort of thing. So that, that's where we are with power management. You can hear more about that from, from Matthew later, I think. Something I want to talk about for just a moment um, is tracing and general visibility into the kernel because this has been an area where we've made big strides over the course of the last couple of years. Um, 2.631 was when perf events went in. Before that, we didn't have an in-kernel um, performance monitoring system, and a whole lot's happened there since then. Come back to that. Um, in 2.632, we saw the addition of the first set of stable trace points or semi-stable um, static trace points into the kernel. There, we didn't have any of those before then. Um, in 3.3, we got some improvements to our dynamic tracing facilities. I don't know how much that's being used yet, but it's there. 
in 35, we got the ability to, to do performance monitoring of a virtualized guest and the host all together as a single unit, which is um, very important to be able to see what's going on on both sides of that boundary and look at the system as a whole. Um, 37 added, that, that's wrong, that's 38 is when we get to conditional trace points, which is just an uh, um, improvement to the way trace points work so we can better filter out the sort of stuff that's actually interesting to trace. So looking at some of this sort of stuff, Perf Events started as um, essentially a driver for access to the low-level performance monitoring hardware built into most processors that we have now. So you can just ask the processor to count how many instruction cycles did this take, how many cache misses did you have, things like that. And you can use it for micro-optimization sorts of, of efforts, that sort of thing. Over time, um, perf, perf has kind of grown in fairly impressive ways. At some point, I think that um, we're all going to be installing the Linux kernel so that we can run perf on it and everything else kind of goes through there. Um, seems to be sort of the Ingo view of the world. Um, so anyway, we can now monitor um, software events as well as hardware events, things like function calls, trace points, things like that. Anything that is an event, you can deal with through the perf subsystem. And there's a whole set of features there for getting that sort of stuff out quickly to user space and various analysis tools. The actual perf user space tool was merged into the kernel tree and shipped with the mainline kernel um, as a way to evolve all this stuff together. And it seems to have worked in terms of inspiring contributions to perf. So what can you do? You can do things like application profiling, like you can do with the current user space tools, but um, it, it profiles on both sides of the kernel user space boundary. Um, so you, you get the, the full picture there, not just user space. It's very nice in that way. Um, figure out what's causing system events, you know, who's causing things to be forced out to swap, who's allocating memory, things like that. Try to figure out what's going on in your system as a whole, various kinds of statistical analysis and so on. A lot you can do with perf. Um, so you can look at the wiki there and various other things. It's, it's an impressive tool. Um, sort of related to it and kind of in conflict with it at times is F-Trace, which is the built-in kernel um, training sy tracing system that we have. Initially called F-Trace because it's just tracing function calls within the kernel, but now it does a whole lot more than that as well. So you can set up F-Trace to find out um, what, what's causing large latencies in the kernel, what is, it, what is it that's causing the kernel to be slow to respond to things, that sort of thing. Um, you can trace um, power states. You can trace memory mapped I.O. operations. It's a very nice reverse engineering tool to see what some sort of um, software is actually doing with, um, with I.O. memory, that sort of stuff. Trace stack usage, um, trace points again, all that sort of stuff. If it's traceable, you can do it with F-Trace. It's also a, um, a powerful and very useful tool, um, kind of fun to play with. I recommend that you take a look at that if you haven't already. I ran a bunch of articles on LW1 written by Stephen Rostad, who did most of the F-Trace work on how this stuff works. So if you look for it there, you'll find that. Related to all this is this concept of trace points. One of the very nice things that D-Trace came with uh, on, on Solaris systems that people really liked is a whole set of, of well-documented trace points placed in the kernel. So if you're interested in, say, when the scheduler is changing processes or something like that, you just look up the trace point and you can hook into it. You don't actually have to know how the kernel code works. Um, Linux has traditionally not had these for all kinds of reasons. We lack the technology to do it right, and um, it took a long time to convince people this was something that we actually wanted. But we're starting to add trace points into the kernel now. I put that there's about 200, but I think this slide's getting slightly out of date. We're probably closer to about 300 of them by now. Um, they, they keep going in with each kernel release. We add, we add more trace points to various things. The, the well-documented part of this is perhaps lagging behind that, but um, we can hope that we'll get there. And we'll get to a point where we'll have a nicely instrumented kernel where you can just sort of turn on things when you want to see what's going on in parts of the kernel and get the information out very nicely and very easily that way. Um, we have still, I think, an interesting discussion over whether these trace points are part of the kernel's application binary interface or not and whether kernel developers can actually change them. And we thought we'd resolve that at the kernel summit, but then um, it seemed like maybe we didn't, so I'm not sure. Um, we may see another fight yet over whether this stuff is actually ABI or not. Finally, um, with regard to tracing, the other thing that's just worth mentioning is system tap, because it is still out there. They just released 1.4, I think, um, new release of system tap. System tap being a powerful dynamic tracing environment really aimed at competing with, with, uh, with D-Trace. All that system tap has never quite met its potential. It may really never make it into the mainline just because of the way that they work and, or don't work with the kernel community. 
but it's out there and people use it and um, I suspect they'll continue to work on it for a while. So, final topic, this is something I'm going to talk about very quickly, is security. Um, security of the kernel as a whole. So, a while back I put together this slide. Um, just looking at, at CVE numbers for the kernel. This is not all the CVE numbers for the kernel for t um, 2010. I simply ran out of space on the slide. Um, we had well over 100 of them. Lots of vulnerabilities in the kernel. So I actually raised this at the kernel summit and asked if people if they thought it was a problem. And the answer I got for the most part was no, you know, bugs are bugs. Our bugs are more security relevant than a lot of other bugs just because the way the kernel works and we will continue to fix bugs whenever we find them. Um, on the other hand, I am starting to see more people trying to actually actively look for sources of, of kernel bugs and maybe try to harden the kernel against them and improve things. And this is good because um, we do have a real problem out there with regard to this. Once upon a time, we were defending our systems against script kitties, and that wasn't really that big a deal to do. You could deal with it and for the most part. What we're starting to see, I and mean, we've been seeing for a little while really, is um, actors who are much more motivated and much more capable, whether they're um, organized crime type people or, or governments. Well, we su suppose there's a difference um, between the two um, <laughs> for the moment. Where we've got people who have um, fairly serious resources and very strong motivation doing stuff, and they're writing things like Stuxnet or whatever. and. Um, doing some pretty impressive things with that. And so we're going to think about if we can possibly defend against that kind of thing and what we can be doing to better handle it. And the, the problem is hard. This is one of my favorite um, exploits that came out over the course of the last year. It was posted. Um, it's good because it actually takes advantage of three different holes and has to use them all to actually exploit the kernel. You know, you got one that can allow you to make the kernel right to, to a null pointer, essentially like that. Um, or actually what you can do is you can write a null pointer to an arbitrary address after an oops. There's another one that can force an oops um, and a couple of them and you can have driver allow you to actually force the oops and to force that write to be in the right place so that you could essentially write that zero to a location which happened to be your um, user ID. And so, um, you know, instant root process, right? And this exploit worked. And it works by exploiting all three of these. So things that look like they're not all that severe, with somebody who's sufficiently motivated, I am amazed what some of these people can do with what seems like just a tiny little vulnerability. So we have a real problem there. And the solution to that, I don't know. You know, we're seeing various things going into the kernel over time, most of which are not really aimed at this problem, trying to improve, add various things at the access control level, which is not really where our problem is, I don't think, um, at this point. And again, like I mentioned, there are other people who are trying to harden the kernel now, so we're starting to see some stuff going in. Um, but we'll see. I put down FA Notify for 37. This is a malware scanning, virus scanning sort of thing. And actually, the, the user space connection to that actually got disconnected before 37 went out because they found some ABI problems with it. And I don't think that's been, um, been fixed ever since. I think it's been kind of sitting idle in the kernel and they haven't actually done the part to actually fix up the ABI. And like I said, various sorts of things, trying to get some of the stuff out of the GR security tree, the, the same parts, as they say, of, of the GR security tree, things like that, trying to move it into the kernel and harden our kernel over time. And hopefully we'll get there. And that is where I stop um, almost exactly on time, believe it or not. But um, I do have a couple moments for questions, if, if there are any. Way in the back. Yeah, how, how does the deadline scheduler figure out the worst case execution time? And the answer is it doesn't. The, the process has to tell me. It says, I want a maximum of this much time. And in fact, the way deadline schedulers work, if, if the process exceeds that worst case time, it just gets thrown out. It, it loses. It's done. Um, it's not going to make its deadline anymore. But no, the scheduler can't possibly know. Now, there, there are people in the academic community doing research trying to actually prove worst case execution times for certain kinds of things. But that's a gnarly task, and I don't think we'll see that for a while. But it's very similar to the halting problem, yeah. So for now, developers have to guess and actually watch what happens on a real running system.
Any other questions? If not, I will get out of the way, and thank you all very much.